In terms of running consultations in Trinidad and Tobago, we did it in a number of ways. Um, one, we used the thematic areas, so we invited those CSOs who are aligned to different groups like environment or trade or human rights. Secondly, we discussed with um, a number, two or three um, NGOs who are involved, smaller NGOs who are involved in service delivery, but who we know are involved in scaling up their activities to get involved in governance issues. So we met them at their offices or they came to our offices and we discussed among ourselves, you know, what they were doing, what they were interested in, and the roadmap activities and what, whether they would be involved in it or interested in it. The hesitations were a number of them, actually. A lot of them did not see the need to consult with us if they were not going to be in receipt of funds after, because most of them were seeking funding for their own activities. A lot of them did not know um, the full intent of the document. And by engaging with us, whether it's going to upscale their own capacity or sustain their activities, a lot of them are really interested in, in how can we support them if they are supporting us, how can we support them? I think we try to, to put it in the context of how important civil society organi organizations are in terms of development. We wanted them to see in terms of the development process in Trinidad and Tobago, they have to get more involved in not only policy making, but accountability issues. And we said, we are going to build your institutions to help you to attain those rules, to, to, to use those objectives. Instead of pure service delivery, which they have been doing great for a number of years, we just wanted to start to think in a more macro way in terms of development. So it gave them a little, a little um, uh, more optimism about this whole engagement process. We decided to engage civil society because we were a little concerned that they came to us in droves asking for requests, ad hoc arrangements, and we decided to engage them formally. And uh, One of the things we understood, anecdotally, we had a lot of evidence about civil society, uh, but we wanted to, it to be more formalized, more empirical. So we conducted a mapping exercise in which we found out who is doing what, where, what capacity they had. This mapping exercise in terms of the results, we shared it, we consulted with them, we discussed some of the results with them to see where they were, we distributed it widely, so they knew about it. A lot of them were quite pleased with the results, they, were, um, they shared a lot of the sentiments and the recommendations, so that mapping informed a lot of what we are going to put in the roadmap activity. So we just saw it as a second step in terms of how we are going to engage civil society formally. I was telling my colleagues I've already done a draft and not to boast but just because a lot of the groundwork was already set so we didn't have to start from scratch, you know. We can't drop the ball. We don't have a lot of funding but for the first time we have gotten over 3 million euros in funding. So it's a lot given the, the context of civil society in Trinidad and what we had offered before. So we have been boasting about, yes, we have gotten money under human rights, we have gotten money under CSOLA thematic groups, as well as in our 11th EDF NIP, we have money for civil society. For the first time in a long time, we have dedicated funds to support civil society. So it's a big step, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a welcome um, activity for us to, to support them and for them to see we are serious about supporting them to scale up their activities and to challenge all the governance issues that, that, uh, that exist in Trinidad and Tobago.